us know that no greater love has a, a person as a man that he will lay down his life for his friends. I'm thankful that not only is Jesus Christ a friend that I know will stick closer to me than a brother, but also he is the one that purchased my salvation. He's the one that purchased the opportunity for me to leave, leave this sinful world and spend eternity in heaven. I'm glad I know him as my Messiah.
and this is the King James Version. And it reads like this. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. I'm going to give you the title of my message, although you probably will not be able to comprehend yet how it goes with my scriptural text. But I pray that you will understand by the time I finish. And the title of my message today is simply, He Lives, the Lord Jesus Lives. Someone say amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Say amen to the reading of the word. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. Thank you, Lord. He Lives. And I suppose that if I had a subtitle, it would be, He Lives. Let's act like we believe it. He lives. And if we really believe that, then let's act like we believe it. Amber talked about dreams and before she sang her song, and, and Patty will tell you, I am not a person who dreams a lot. Or let me say this, I know that, I guess some experts say that everyone dreams. Well, if I dream, that I do not usually remember my dreams. This past Monday night I had a dream that I remembered. In fact, 
I remember dreaming this dream, and then I woke up, and I fell back to sleep, and the dream picked up right where it left off when I woke up. And this dream was so weird. In it, I was directing a huge, multi-room choir. I would go from room to room directing this choir made up of men and women and young people. I'd, smoke, I'd go from room to room to room. Now let me say this. I have been Pentecostal since I was 12 years old, so I think I know pretty well what style of music that Pentecostals usually sing. You heard a pretty good example of it this morning. Well, in my dream, I was directing this multi-room choir, and the song that I was directing was written in 1933 by a man named Alfred Henry Ackley. And the name of the song is He Lives. And it's also known by the first line of the verse, which reads, I serve a risen Savior. And I was directing it. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me. And I go to another room along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Now that's a fine song. And finally sung by my <laughs> The whole message just went to pop right there. <laughs> but that is a fine song, but it just does not have, shall we say, a Pentecostal beat. So why was I, a Pentecostal, leading a mass choir, room, multi-room choir, in that song? Now, it would be more my speed to lead, I can feel it in my hand. I can feel it in my feet, I can feel it in my heart, I can feel him all over me. God's not dead, he's alive. Preach, sing, play. Let me tell you something. You guys had the total package. Amen, <laughs> 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 When I was growing up, we used to call that Jack. <laughs> Jack of all trades, master of none. And that sounds about right. And he said, also, I'm humble. <laughs> <laughs> but why was I a Pentecostal dreaming about leading a choir in Alfred Henry Ackley's He Lives? Well, I didn't know for sure right then, but I did have an idea that the Lord was trying to tell me something. And he knew that I would pay attention to a dream like that because it was so weird. That was on Monday night. Well, Tuesday afternoon, Patty had made me a wonderful dinner of roast pork, real mashed potatoes. Baby, get your heart out. <laughs> real mashed potatoes and green peas. And as I was digging in, she came in where I was eating, and she read for me a thought that the Lord had given her that day for someone else. And it was built around Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 6. I read it for you earlier. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And she went on to tell me that the word acknowledge means to admit to be real or true. To, and notice this now, to recognize the existence, truth, or fact of something. Now, I had not told her my dream because, frankly, it was so weird I wasn't sure if it was just a bean dream or not. But when she told me about the word from the Lord that she had gotten, I knew what that dream meant. And I told her about the dream and I told her that I felt like the Lord was giving me something for our church gathering for this church. And that something is that we need to be reminded that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, lives. 
And we need to make sure that we are acting like we believe he lives. All right. Someone say amen. amen. Sister Sharita did a great job leading a Bible discussion on integrity this past Wednesday night. That's right. yeah. Integrity in our natural lives is very important. Not only from the standpoint that having integrity in our everyday life will make our time on this, life, on this earth easier for us, but exercising integrity in everyday life will also keep us out of trouble. Right. That's right. Amen. We'll stay out of trouble with the law because there are natural laws that will punish us when we do not exercise integrity. Right. Now, if you don't believe that's the truth, then I challenge you to stop by Food Lion on 98 here on your way home, fill up a buggy full of groceries, and then walk out without having the integrity to pay for them. And you'll see how the law will punish your lack of integrity. All right. But as Sister Sharita pointed out on Wednesday night, along with exercising integrity in our natural life, we are challenged to exercise and exhibit integrity in our spiritual lives, in our walk with God. All right. And one of the ways that we do that was outlined by Solomon in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 6 when he wrote, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now that word acknowledge, that we generally zero in on that word in that scripture, acknowledge him, acknowledge God, and he will direct thy paths. But in addition to that word acknowledge, there are three very powerful words preceding acknowledge, which really gives that verse the power that it has. Solomon wrote, in all thy ways, acknowledge God. Let me substitute some of the words that the dictionary used to define knowledge. In all thy ways, recognize the existence of God. In all thy ways, exhibit in all thy ways, show that God is real, that God is true. In all thy ways, show that it is a fact that God lives. Now, every sentence that I just said would merit a hearty and well-deserved amen. But the question that I have is, are we really recognizing the existence of God? Are we really exhibiting that God is real, that God is truth, that God it is a fact, that God lives? Are we really doing all of that in the way that Solomon said that we should? Are we really acknowledging God in all our ways? I read that it is commonly believed that Bible scholars by Bible scholars, that Solomon spoke and wrote in Hebrew. The English word ways in Hebrew chapter 3 and verse number 6 was translated from the Hebrew word terek. Terek. And one of its meanings is a course of life or a mode of action. My message today is he lives. And if we really believe that, then let us act like we believe it in every aspect of our life. Acknowledging God in all our ways should be automatic. It should be the mode by which we live our life. When Solomon wrote that we are to acknowledge God in all our ways, the message then and still is today that acknowledging God Exhibiting the existence of God, showing that God is real, that God is truth, is something that a real Christian will do as a way of life. Amen. That's right. It, it will be just what you do. Right. You don't have to get up in the morning and decide you're going to act godly that day. <coughs> because it's just what you do. Right. If you're acknowledging God in all thy ways. You don't just go to your car and get ready to go to work and decide that that day you're going to be a Christian, you're going to act like a Christian. You don't do that. It's just something that you do because you are acknowledging God in all your ways. 
You say, well, I'm in church today, Pastor. Isn't that acknowledging God in all my ways? It's good to see everyone that's here today. Attendance today looks a lot better than the eight, eight, eight that we had in attendance last Sunday. I'm glad that you're here today, but coming to church on Sunday does not, hear me now, does not fulfill the words of Solomon or I believe the expectations of our Lord of acknowledging God in all your ways. It's easy to come into this place and feel the presence of the Lord when the praise team sings and when you drop a few bucks in the offering. It's easy to wave at the Lord and say, Pastor Rusty, present and accounted for, Lord. We should, we should, we should gather together. We are told to do so in the book of Hebrews. Those around this nation who are not gathering for whatever reason with their brothers and their sisters. And the Lord, listen to me, they're missing out on the strength that we get from each other. They're missing out on that. And if they're not careful, Brother Billy has touched on this in some of his teaching, if we're not careful, the habit, the habit of not going to church will become so strong that they never will go back to church. And then they will be in real danger of the devil hanging their soul on the trophy in the trophy room of hell. All right. That ain't about right. That is right. I heard one preacher say one time, it's tight, but it's right. Amen. It is important to attend services. But coming in here on a Sunday morning cannot be the sum total of your acknowledging God in all your ways. It cannot be all that you do. Acknowledging God in all your ways is treating those whom you come in contact with in the world the way a Christian should treat them. And that is part of acknowledging God in all your ways. Creating a godly atmosphere in your home is part of acknowledging God in all thy ways. Making God first in the gifts of your finances and in the gift of your time is part of acknowledging God in all your ways. Treating your family like a godly person that you are striving to be is part of acknowledging God in all thy ways. Let me put a 2020 definition to this. What and how you post on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or WeChat or Tumblr or Reddit or YouTube is definitely a part of acknowledging God in all your ways. Amen. Amen. We have to be careful that we do not let all of the static that the devil is serving up around us to knock us off course. We have to be careful that we do not allow Satan to distract us for one moment in our walk with God. Some may be thinking, well, that'll never happen to me, preacher. I am dead set on course. Nothing will distract me. My friend, that is exactly the thinking that the devil wants you to do. The devil would have you just go with the flow. Never get to the point where you throw up your hands and say enough is enough. My walk with God, my soul is too important for me to go along with some of the things of this world. The devil would have that never to happen in your life. Let me show you how easy it can be to get off course. How easy it can be to get distracted. The apostle named Thomas got off course. He got distracted. The poor guy will ever be known as Doubting Thomas. If he were alive today, he would still carry the dogma of doubting Thomas. And here's the reason why. After the resurrection, Jesus showed himself a few times. 
In John chapter 20, John recorded that Jesus had shown himself to the apostles. John 20 and 19 reads, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Jesus had come to be with them, but notice verse number 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Where was Thomas at? We don't know. We're not told that. But then the rest of the apostles told Thomas about Jesus in verse number 25. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, he said, I will not believe. Now let me make a few statements about Thomas that I believe are true. You can make your own decision. The Bible does not really share with us when Thomas became one of the twelve. Sometime in the, in the Gospels, we'll read how so-and-so brought his brother to Jesus or how Jesus called. We don't know when Thomas became one of the twelve. But I read one article that stated that Thomas must have been a follower of Jesus prior to Jesus calling him to be one of the twelve. He could have been a follower of John the Baptist. My point is this, that Thomas must have been in attendance when Jesus had performed the miracles, including raising Lazarus from the dead. That's point number one. Point number two, Thomas had traveled with Jesus during his entire public ministry about three and a half years. Thomas must have known that Jesus had predicted his own resurrection. And that if Jesus could feed a multitude with two fish and five loaves and raise a man from the dead and heal leprosy and open eyes and more, surely Thomas believed that Jesus would fulfill what he said and when he was telling the truth, when he said he was going to rise from the grave. That's point number two. And finally, point number three, Thomas had spent at least three and a half years with the other apostles. And he must have, in three and a half years, he must have developed some type of relationship with at least a few of them that was close enough that Thomas believed that that one would not lie to him about Jesus being alive. If Sean came to me and said, I saw Jesus, I would believe him. Now, if Billy came to me. <laughs> My point is that Thomas must have spent time with those apostles, the other apostles, and he must have developed a relationship that there would be no reason why he should doubt. Maybe he didn't believe all of them, but he should have believed some of them when they said, we saw Jesus. That's point number three. But yet, here we are, Thomas, doubting Thomas, said that he will not believe until he sees for himself that Jesus is alive. Now, it's not told to us, and I don't know what it was that caused Thomas to lose his faith in Jesus, to lose his way during the time that Jesus was crucified to the time that Jesus told Thomas to put your finger in the holes in my hands, thrust your hand in my, into my side. All I know is that here was a man who had walked with Jesus Christ himself, who had heard Jesus Christ teach, who had seen all that he had seen, and yet something had influenced Thomas so much, something had distracted Thomas so much that Thomas was not acting like Jesus was alive. And it took a demonstration by Jesus before Thomas would acknowledge him. It took a demonstration by Jesus before Thomas would acknowledge that he was alive. 
And my friends, my brothers, my sisters, if that could happen to Thomas, we need to be mindful because the same thing could happen to us. We could get so distracted, so caught up in the static of the sin of this world that we no longer act like we believe that Jesus lives. I'm preaching today, he lives, and if we really believe that, then let's act like we believe it. Jesus was asked one day what the greatest commandment was. Jesus answered in Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Patty was listening to a sermon on YouTube this week, and I heard a preacher say, I don't know who it was, but I heard a preacher say, In order for us to fulfill that great commandment, then we must replace every other worldly affection that we have with love for God. If we are to fulfill that commandment by, from the words of Jesus, some have said, I've heard this in the past. Well, I don't need to believe the words of anyone else. I want to believe the words of Jesus. Red letters, baby, red letters. Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And the only way we're going to do that is if we replace the affections that we have for the things of this world with the love of God, our love for God. That's the only way. You can try to love God in the world. I said this in a sermon some time ago, trying to mix love for God and love for this world is like trying to mix oil and water. It might look like it will work for a short time, but in the end, the oil will separate from the water. You can try to love God and love the world, but in the end, hear me now, this is so important, you will either love God or you will love the world because it's just not possible to do both. Just not possible. In just a few minutes, we are going to observe the Lord's Supper. As we do that, as we remember the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of our Lord, I challenge us all from this platform to the last seat in the back. I challenge us all that if we really believe that he lives, and I believe that everyone in this room does, if we really believe that Jesus lives, then let's act like we believe it. And acknowledge God in all our ways. Amen. We have a very important election coming up in the next few weeks. Some believe that this election, regardless of the results, will prompt a revolt in this nation like has not been seen in over 150 years. And we as Christians... Some believe this. We as Christians are going to be required to act like Jesus lives in ways that we cannot even predict. Some believe that what is happening in our world right now is a reflection of end time prophecy. I don't know if either or if both is true. But I'm not prepared to dismiss the possibility I tell you what I'm going to do for myself, and I challenge you to do, do what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 44, when Jesus was asked about the end of time on this earth, Jesus said, Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. We don't know what the next four years will bring. We don't know what the next year will bring or the next month or the next week will bring. We don't even know what tomorrow will bring. I'm supposed to turn 60 years old tomorrow. I I may not make it. Let's all pray that I do. (laughs) But we don't know what tomorrow will bring. 
All we can do is to make sure, make sure that our actions reflect our belief that Jesus lives and make sure that our soul is ready to meet the Lord. Jesus said, just be ready. Just be ready. Amen. Jesus lives. Let's act like we believe it. Let's acknowledge God in all our ways. Someone say amen. amen. Please stand with me right now and come to